You know, there's two kinds of obedience in this life. There's the kind when your mom and dad are there. There's that kind when your grandma and grandpa are there watching. And, and, and you know, you, you're thinking, hey, it's 5.45 and dinner's in a few minutes, but grandma sees so you don't eat that extra cookie. How many guys know what I'm talking about? You know, there's that, there's that element of, uh, you know, mom and, dad, uh, m- m- mom and dad are here, so you're going to go to the corner and press the little button that says walk or don't walk, and you're, and you're going to be in the crosswalk. Now, if you're, a, if you're a girl, maybe you can't relate to that as much as a guy can, okay? Um, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's that idea of, uh, hey, I've just got, I, I got to impress mom and dad so they'll think I'm an angel the rest of the time also. And then there's that, and then there's that, that obedience when, when no, no level of authority is around. You know, it's, it's uh, hey, you, you, you stop at that stop sign instead of roll through it like everybody else does. Okay, or you, or you, uh, or you arrive on, on, on October 31st, you arrive at that house, then it says, you know, the, the, the family's not there, and it just says, take one piece of candy. Oh you, oh, you guys have done that too? I watched other people do that, okay, um, and then I did it myself. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're you know, you're, you're, you're an 11 year old boy and you're walking down the street and you see this, you see this old house and there's this window pane there just leaned up nice against a tree and there's about 25 rocks on the ground and you're like, mom and dad are not there. So you just enjoy the beauty of that window pane and you don't throw the rocks, um, you know, and, and maybe that's because you're embarrassed because you might not break it and your friends would laugh at you. Um, it, you know, it's, it's when you don't hit your brother back when mom and dad aren't around. There's something incredible about these two different kinds of obedience because it's, it's, when, we, it's when we fall into that second level obedience that we really reach that point in life where we say, I'm choosing to honor God with my life. There's something absolutely fabulous about what we would call self-decision. I, I, I was not very good at self-decision growing up. You know, um, I wanted to go swimming, and so I asked a couple of my friends if they wanted to go over to Stag High and just hop the fence and go swimming, and so we did. And um, before you know it, there was like 35 people in back of us, and and all of a sudden I realized that there was this, this red thing going around outside. And, and um, so what did I do? Like any other, like any other 17 year old, I hid, I hid under the bleachers, um, you know, because, because I was ashamed because, because I was ashamed because my mom and dad would be disappointed. There's something about, I had not chosen in my life yet to honor God. I'd not chosen in my life to obey God. I'd not chosen in my life to submit to God because I didn't understand the values of it. Why do we choose to be obedient regardless of who is or isn't looking? It's because we reach that point where we say, I want to honor God and I want to develop a habit of trust. I want to emphasize that second one. I want to develop a habit of trust. You know, I'm one of those people who uh, my mom and dad didn't know when to believe me and when to not believe me. Why? Because I didn't have a very good trustworthy path. And quite frankly, I'm one of those people that everything changed when I met Jesus Christ. I gave up some terrible habits instantaneously and Never returned to some of them. And some of them, it was 17 years before I ever went back to them. But I understand this need for, for developing an element of trust. Um, I've, sh- I've shared this illustration before, but it's so applicable here. Um, I had a wood shop in high school, and I only remember one thing, okay? And that's this. Uh, if you go against the grain one time, if you go against the grain one time with the sandpaper, 
It takes 100 strokes going with the grain to get rid of it. That means it takes 100 elements of trust to make up for the one trust that you broke. It's not, hey, you can believe me now. There's really just that issue of saying, I want to please God. I want to develop an honoring God attitude, and I want to develop a habit of trust. Father God, I pray that this morning that you would be the potter and we'd be the clay. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing unto you. Amen. You know, um, when, when I bring this element of two kinds of obedience up, I'm following back to last week where we understand that Jesus was obedient to death, even death on a cross, and, um, and that his name would be praised um, as a result of that. Um, and, and, and we pick it up, we pick it up in, in chapter 2 of Philippians, starting in verse 12, and it says, therefore, what it, how many of you guys know what the word therefore really means? What's it there for? It's there for what happened previously. And what happened previously is that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He developed and he had an attitude of trust. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. They had it down, right? They had it down. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Boy, I've, <laughs> that doesn't fit very many teenagers, right? That doesn't fit, fit, fit a whole lot of us. So that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. As you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you, so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. You know, the, the first part of this answers one of the great questions in all the world, and it's this. Can I earn my salvation? Can I earn my salvation? Look at this verse. It says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, I want you to know that the best way I could explain this is, 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 is from my yard. In my yard, we have and have had a variety of different fruit trees. Two of them I ran over with the lawnmower and they just like disappeared, okay? I didn't even know they were there. I didn't even know we owned one, okay? Um, and, and, and Bev said, hey, what happened to the... And I said, did we have one of those? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, I guess I backed over with the lawnmower. And um, anyway, you, you know, so, 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 so we have a cherry tree. We have an apricot tree. We have a nectarine tree. We had a lemon tree. It died, okay? Um, we had a new plum tree, and that's the one of the ones I ran over, okay? We have an apricot tree, and, and we have a plum tree. And every year, those trees work out what they really are, okay? We, we, we get about 1,300 plums on this little miniature plum tree. I'm, I'm glad we don't have a big plum tree, okay? I want you to know. I want you to know, every spring, about the, about the middle of June, it just kind of goes, bam color. And it's working out what it is. It's not, it's not becoming a plum tree because of the fruit. It's demonstrating that it's a plum tree by the fruit. Now, th that, that tree is... I wish all of our trees were that great when it came to producing fruit, okay? We have a cherry tree, and I think we got 21 of them this year, okay? But it worked itself out, okay? We have a peach tree, and that one does pretty good sometimes, but 
a couple of the branches died, and now we only have one good branch off of it, and um, it might be better as firewood. We have a lemon tree, and that one died. Okay, we have a we have a blueberry bush. I want you to know we had f we had about twelve nectarines this year. Some of them are new, but they working out what they are. And you and I are told by Paul here to work out our salvation. In other words, let's show who we are in Christ by the way we are. Could you say work out, work out. our salvation? You know what? What a beautiful picture. It is an absolutely gorgeous picture of the body of Christ when it is working out their salvation. Because if we're not working out their, our salvation, you know what we are? We're sourpusses. And we're negative on who God is and we're negative on what God does. And we're not working out our salvation. We're demonstrating the power of the evil one. This is what you and I are being told by Paul here, working out, getting on the outside of our life that which is on the inside. A couple of their little pieces of information that are kind of important. This book was written to believers, therefore it is not about earning your salvation. This verse starts with the phrase, as you have always. They got a habit here, right? They got a habit of working out their salvation. They're just continuing to do so. Um, if, if this were about earning your salvation, it would be a contradiction to things that Paul had told uh, some of the other churches, one of which is, is, the, uh, is the church in Ephesus where it says in chapter 2, verse 8 of Ephesians, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the free gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Okay, um, uh, have, you ever, have you ever bought a cheap imitation product? Have you? And you ever gotten, no, this has got to be the real thing. Imitation Fritos do not exist. They, they, they don't. They, they just don't exist. All right? Um, and, and, you know, imitation ruffles do not exist. Imitation... I'm showing my weaknesses here, okay? Imitation ho-hos do not exist. <laughs> All right? <sighs> Imitation Dr. Pepper does not exist. Now, I gave those things up, and I'm trying to stay true to that. But the idea is this. We are not to be a cheap, almost good enough. We're supposed to be a genuine replica as we work out our salvation. In verse 13, Paul kind of goes on here and he talks about, about God working in us. It says in verse 13, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. In other words, his desire is for us to, to have the will to want to act a certain way and, and, and the action that is consistent with what the will is. Okay, now that, that's, that's, that's super simple, but Paul is saying this. He says, I want you to be useful, but I want you to want to be useful. I want you to want to be a difference maker, and I want you to be a difference maker. In other words, there's that idea that says, Lord, I want to serve you, and I will, and I do. Because God is at work in us. The same English word that we use for energy comes from the word work in the Greek. In other words, what that means is this. The energy that we're provided to serve comes from the Holy Spirit. You know, when we were saying the Apostles' Creed, there's this one line that says, and I, believe in the whole, and I believe in the Holy Spirit, or I believe in the Holy Ghost. And today, I said that a little bit louder than normal because of, 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 of this idea that God works in us. You know, when we, speak about the, when we speak about the Holy Spirit, there's this word in the New Testament, and it's the word dynamo. And it's referring to Jesus. It's referring to the Holy Spirit and saying, he's a dynamo. That's where we get the word dynamite from. That's actually where we get the word fireworks from eventually. 
there's an explosion of energy. Can you say that? Explosion of energy because of who the Holy Spirit is. And what he's saying is this. That, that energy is going to will you to do the right thing, and it's going to help you do the right thing. But it all starts with that desire that says, I want to do right even when no one is looking because God Almighty is looking down at me. Isn't it a privilege to be noticed sometimes when you do something? Because God notices every single time. And isn't it nice sometimes just to do something nice but not be noticed by humans? Of course it is. How do we know about the Holy Spirit's power? Because it rose Lazarus from the dead. How do we know about the Holy Spirit's power? Because the Holy Spirit enabled Ezekiel to prophesy to a bunch of dead bones. Oh, gosh, I wish I was there in the Old Testament. Wouldn't you love to have been on the valley of the dry bones and Ezekiel just says, bones, get up and dance. Oh. How many of you are like, I missed it? (laughs) Nobody hear that old? I want you to know, oh, there's, there's several miracles that are like, they're not in my top 10. That one's in my top 10. Because then it started growing ligaments. Oh. The power of the Holy Spirit. Samson being blind and chained to a couple of pillars and saying, Dear Lord, give me your spirit one more time so that you might be revealed. That's dynamo. That's the, war, that's the spirit of God at work in us. You know, there, there, there's something incredible about about God at work in us because there's this idea of a will, okay? Uh, anybody here ever coached a team before? Okay, now, if you coach track, this is all you need to know. Run. <laughs> you don't need to know anything else. Pete, you don't even need, that's all you need to know, Pete. You want to coach cross country, y- you, you got to yell a little louder because they're farther away. Run! And then you just grab your thirsty two-ouncer and sit in the chair and wait for him to come around and say, run again. But I want you to know that most coaches, they have this, they have this desire to, to will into their athletes the desire to give their absolute best. I, I, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Winning and losing does not mean a lot to me. Okay, it used to. I was, I was one of the poorest sports in the whole world. This is a true story. This is the kind of, this is the lousy sport that I was. A kid hit me in a double play once. I was on first. I called him an idiot. I threw my helmet at him, and I said, y- you ought to be off the team. Y- y- you're so stupid, you hit me into a double play. Y- y- you know, that's two outs. Anyway, I just, I, I was poor, okay? But a real coach is, is, is changing attitudes of people like me that say something different. The reason why I don't really care if we win or lose is because sometimes we can't measure how good the other team is. And the truth is this. What I've always wanted out of my athletes is this. Would you please learn to give your absolute best effort? Would you learn to hold absolutely nothing back because this is a measurement of other things in your life that you will learn to give your all for. I remember saying this to a group of students once, and I said, I said, are you going to be the kind of parent who gives up on your kid? Then, then, then don't give up on God. Are you going to be the kind of child who, who grows up, and you're going to be a lousy spouse, and you're just going to give up on your spouse for all the wrong reasons? I said, then learn to give everything you have and learn to find the will inside of you. And I coached at a Christian high school so I could say this part too. Because the Holy Spirit is at work in you, trying to get you to understand that you still have more to give. And that He is a resource inside of you. And there's something absolutely incredible. It's not just yelling at the kid. It's not for my benefit. It's that I'm molding a student here into becoming who it is that God would like them to be. 
God has work in us. Think about Moses. Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness being molded. I don't know if he even enjoyed any of those days. I really don't. I don't know if he enjoyed any of them. But he was being molded because God was at work. And here, this, this passage goes on. So, so it's, not just, it's, it's not just that we're working out our salvation. It's not just that God is at work in us. But it's that, it's that we're going to be a shining example in a crooked and wicked world. There are many people who come to Christ because they'll say, man, I saw Roe. And the way Roe lived caused me to realize I was missing something. And I want what Roe has. I, I, I see Bill. And, and, and I watch Bill in his life. And, and I realize that Bill is not the same person that he used to be. But he's at peace with God. And I want what he has. And that example is what draws many people to the Lord. And that example is also what causes us as the body of Christ to not give up. Does that make sense? Somebody says, man, Amy's serving the Lord like unbelievably. She's just a great example of, of giving. And we're saying, I want to be like that too. I can be like that too. There's something absolutely phenomenal about, about, quote, listen to this, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you will shine like stars in the universe. Absolutely phenomenal. You know, coming back to the idea of coaching, coaching, um, Every once in a while, a coach gets that, that athlete that is what I call a coach's dream. They just don't complain. That was not me, okay? <laughs> they just don't complain. They don't complain about anything. Hey, um, so I was a swimmer in high school, and, and, I, I, and, and guess, guess what we did when the coach got mad at the way we were acting? We didn't run. <laughs> we swam. Hey, hey, I, 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 and, and, and we... And though it's hard to murmur when your mouth's in the water, though. I want you to know that, okay? And, and, and I want you, I've swallowed a lot of water murmuring about the coach and murmuring about the rest. And, and, and it's terrible when you throw up in the water and then you got to keep playing water polo in it, okay? It's absolutely awful. But I was a murmurer. I, I, but then there's that coach's dream who works hard all the time, who encourages their teammates to do the best that sees the player who needs some help and they give him some help. This verse points to the idea of not being a murmuring person, to realize that murmuring causes division amongst the team, that murmuring causes a complaining rest of the team, and it makes a crooked and a world, it makes a crooked team. Murmuring is the downfall of a team. Murmuring is the implosion of a company. Murmuring is the poison in a church. Murmuring is the inch that becomes a mile. This, point, this verse points out how needy this generation is because they're filled with air. I have a dear friend who, uh, he told his two boys once, he said, boys, he said, Phil and Steve, I want you to know this. All you got to do is be a little bit better than average to be better than everybody else. Because almost everybody in the world is satisfied with mediocrity. He says, but if you want to please God, learn to give your best all the time. There's something about being a shining example. I want, I want to share with you uh, a, a story that's a true story, Okay. This is a boy I met in ninth grade. His name's Ryan, and he, this is what he looks like now. In, in, in ninth grade, he, uh, uh, he used to tell me this all the time. Mr. Hathorne, I got a 7 out of 10 on my memory verse today. Man, that's, I'm keeping my mom off my back. And then a little while later, he'd say, you know, that's the important thing is keeping my mom off my back. That was his approach to life in seventh grade. Ninth grade was to keep his mom off his back. This is the same, but this, this, this boy and I had lunch together three times a week with a group of about five other people, 
every year, all four years of high school. This is him in 10th grade. Mr. Hathorne, what do you mean doing things to please God? Do you think God really cares about my results in life? That's a 10th grader asking this question. We had, we had some incredible conversations at lunch, okay? That's him in 10th grade, all right? He's still satisfied with 7 out of 10. In fact, he told me, Mr. Hathorne, I found out that my mom's okay with 65%. <laughs> okay, this is him in 11th grade. Mr. Hathorne, do you think God knows about my efforts and do you think he cares? I'm not sure about this pleasing God thing and Jesus being the audience of one, but I'm going to try. Let me tell you, this young man came back a completely different person his senior year of high school. And this is him, senior year of high school. Okay? Mr. Hathorne, why didn't you show us this stuff before? <laughs> and I'm like, because your ears are deaf, bucko. He said this to me. He said, there's this little girl with sound Down syndrome who wants to learn to rollerblade. Do you think I could be late 20 minutes to practice to help her learn? I'm, I'm being honest with you. I'm a coach. <laughs> How do you say no to this kind of request? <laughs> I said yes. Now, when this was happening, he had a job at a um, um, Philly cheesesteak in Lodi. And, and uh, he had just gotten a paycheck, and we're having a canned food drive at the school. And the, and the winning grade, okay, got some great prize. And, and he goes, Mr. Rathorn, he goes, I'm spending my entire paycheck. It was like $225. i am spending my entire paycheck on canned foods to help out. He said, help out. What does competitive John Hathorne think? Let's buy tomato sauce cans and let's get these totals high, man. Let's buy, bo let's buy boxed macaroni and cheese, the cheap kind, not craft, and let's get the total higher, right? He shows up with Dinny Moore, Dinny Moore stew in the big cans. I'm like, Ryan, Ryan, what's the matter with you? He goes, Mr. Hathorne, are you really going to eat a can of tomato sauce if you're homeless? He goes, you know, for 20 cents extra, you can get the pull top kind. I'm like, Ryan, Ryan, what is the matter with you? And he goes, I told you I'm giving this. This is a true, this is an absolutely true story. I'm thinking, man, he could have got like about 900 cans of tomato sauce, right? Now, nah, probably 9,000. I mean, you know, uh, you know, you buy the store brand, it's even better. But he shows up with like, um, they were like $2.19 a piece. And he's only got like 100 of them. And I go, Ryan. And I looked at him and he goes, you're proud of me, aren't you? <laughs> and I wanted to say, dude, you just cost us the, you just cost us the canned food. I, I, I said, yes, I am. <laughs> this is Ryan six weeks later after both of these things. Mr. Hathorne, I don't care if you kick me off the team. But Mia knows how to rollerblade, and now she wants to learn to ride a bike. Can you believe it? I'm going to help a special needs girl learn to ride a bike. That's a transformed life right there. Ryan and I have laughed about that. Every, every year, the four years after he got out of school, he and, he and these same kids that we had lunch together we, we, we'd get together, and the first thing that would come up would be, everybody remember how dumb Ryan was in ninth grade? And then we'd come to the story. Uh, Mia, was a, Mia was a very special little girl. Um, she had Down syndrome, I believe. And um, Ryan got an award at the end of the year, and all he said was, I don't deserve it. Because I've only learned to do this for one year. He says, I still got 17 years to make up for. But here's the idea. That's a shining example. That's somebody who wants to do what is right even when nobody's around. 
That's somebody who God has worked inside of. This is somebody who's working out their salvation. Is he perfect? Heck no. You ought to meet him. But you know what? He's a shining example because if you walk through this passage, you realize that he's working out his salvation and that God, the Holy Spirit, is working in him and it's helping him to do the right things. And then we come to the last little part here where it says uh, there's a promise to be believed. In verses 16 and 17 and 18, it says, as you hold out the word of life, in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad and rejoice, of all with, uh, rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Um, uh, there's a picture on the next slide. And, and, it, and it's of a... It's of a pot that's pouring out. Do you know that you and I have something that is almost challenging to understand? And it's this. On the bottom of every one of our pots, when we start to pour ourselves out, the Holy Spirit pours into the bottom of it somehow. I don't know how he gets past the clay. I don't know how he opens up a little spot and then he seals it back up. But but the reality is this, it's the ability to pour from our lives because we're being poured into even faster. That's really, that's kind of the conclusion of this. You know, the best way to bring credibility to the Bible is just live it in front of the world. The best way to bring credibility to the Bible and what it teaches is to do what it teaches. 